So we are here to celebrate 30 years of the Roundtable and everybody being here um, and what has happened and what is and what is yet to come. And I think it's going to be an exciting time. So Adam, let me just sort of start with you. Um, in terms of why, why the Roundtable sort of exists, why it is unique, um, it has now been around for a very long time. Um, you've you led it for a very long time. Um, and so what, you know, what's sort of special about it? Um, why did it even need to be created in the first place? So uh, thanks, uh, thank you uh, Lawson, and thank you uh, all my friends uh, here. It's great to be back at the round table and great to be back at the Broadmoor as the uh, voice of God said uh, uh, earlier. This was where the first annual meeting of the, of the round table was back in 1992. Uh, there were about 90 donors there at that time. And we came back in 2009 uh, our keynote speaker was Jim Collins, uh, author of Good to Great. And Phil and Nancy Anschutz won the Simon Prize, now the Simon DeVos Prize, uh, the Simon Prize for philanthropic leadership. They must have enjoyed the experience because two years later, Phil bought this hotel. <laughs> and, and he's transformed it into an even more magnificent property. For me personally, it's just great to be back with the round table, to see so many old friends and to meet new ones. And as I look around the room, I see and see so many longstanding members of the round table, so many newcomers, so many current and former board members. This tells me the organization is flourishing under Elisa's leadership. And of course, it's much more relaxing to come to one of these uh, when I'm no longer president. <laughs> As the third president of this wonderful organization, I was lucky to follow in the footsteps of my two predecessors, Kim Dennis and John Walters. Kim was really the entrepreneur who built the round table. And she and her close friend, uh, Lawson, uh, uh, discussed her uh, the late uh, Whitney Ball, they really created the annual meeting. They created the culture of the round table, the culture of service, the culture of vigorous debate. And of course they went on to, to found uh, Donors Trust. John solidified the round table's reputation for publishing the best publications in the business. Uh, and John went on to uh, he's now the president of the Hudson Institute, uh, one of America's great think tanks. I also was very honored to participate in the search process that led to the selection of, our outst of my outstanding uh, successor. And I'm just delighted to be with Elise uh, this morning. Kim, John, Elise, and I, we all have quite different personalities and we've been different kinds of leaders at the round table, but we have all been guided by the same core principles and the same mission of helping philanthropists to strengthen our free society. Those principles are what's made us unique and those are the principles that have guided us for 30 years. Now, while the Roundtable was created as an independent, standalone organization in 1991, uh, as the film indicated, it really grew out of an informal group of foundation leaders who started meeting in the late 1970s and early 80s. And those leaders were shocked by two events. One was the very public resignation of Henry Ford II as chairman of the Ford Foundation. And the founders of the round table wanted to protect philanthropy from the fate of so many foundations that were ignoring, and in some cases, actually contradicting the intent and cherished principles of the original donors. And the second came when the great neoconservative public intellectual, Irving Kristol, was invited to give a keynote address at another organization serving philanthropists. Irving gave a great speech. It was about the connections between philanthropy 
and, and the private sector, including capitalism. And it's fair to say that, that, that the audience uh, in that other organization did not appreciate his remarks. And so the founders of the Roundtable uh, said, well, maybe we should start our own organization of philanthropists who understand that a vibrant private sector economy generates the wealth that makes philanthropy possible and that voluntary private action offers solutions for society's greatest challenges. So Elise, let's, let's sort of shift forward. You obviously have known the round table and been involved in it prior to taking over. Um, so if we look at now 2021, going to 2022, why, why today? Uh, how, you know, what, what maybe has changed uh, and what probably is a value that for the members um, is important going forward? Yeah, well, first of all, it's so fun to be on stage with two people that uh, I love and admire <laughs> and um, have been friends for, for a long time and continue to be. And to be among so many friends. I just look around the room and uh, this has just become such a home and a community uh, for, for me. Uh, as Lawson mentioned, I and, and Adam mentioned, I uh, ran the Snyder Foundation, um, and there are some Snyder Foundation people in the audience woo um, <laughs> today. So when I started running it, and uh, I, I really needed a lot of guidance and help as we were trying to, you know, as their first non-family staff member, and I was charged with kind of building out the grant making and the governance and the operations. And I was so grateful to find the roundtable because Adam was such a huge um, source of support and guidance and the staff and team at the roundtable. And then just the people around this room became uh, just a source of community for me as I was trying to navigate how to do all of those things. So to now to follow in Adam's footsteps and um, be on stage with Lawson and be among all of you is just, it's really wonderful. Um, I think, you know, we are really seeing um, some, and we've heard about over the last few days, some really disturbing trends in the philanthropic sector um, that have been going on for a long time, but I think have heightened over the last couple of years and, and become really acute. Um, you know, a, a rejection sort of in my generation of um, capitalism, of the free market system, of the values that make America the wonderful country, the exceptional country that it is. And um, that sort of ideology has really taken over the philanthropic sector. And I think the importance of the round table at this point is there's just never been a more important time for an organization like this to stand up for our values, fight for our country, fight for the importance of private voluntary action to solve problems rather than you know, relying on government for things that it should not do, cannot do, um, and, and showing the generosity of Americans and how important that is. And so I think that um, you know, the round table really is you know, kind of out there on its own as a, a philanthropy organization where people can come and learn about these things, come together, find community, and be a united voice um, to say, no, we are gonna stand up for what we believe and, and, this is, and use our resources and our community to do that. So it's, it's an exciting and a really important time. So Adam, we have not just friendly faces in the audience, but familiar faces. Um, in many cases, we've got you know, second generation of family foundations that are now been part of the round table. Um, what, are, what are some of the sort of common reasons why perhaps they maybe originally joined? Maybe how have their needs changed um, the, currently? Well, um, you know, one of the reasons people come to the round table is because they like meetings that are as good as this one. <laughs> And I think, uh, I think uh, they've come to the round table because they agree with our mission. You know, excellence in philanthropy, uh, protecting philanthropic freedom, uh, and helping donors advance liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. 
Uh, let me just say a word about each of those. Uh, the Round Table's almanac of, of American philanthropy, I think many of you know it, by, by Carl Zinsmeister. It remains the very best book ever published on the greatest achievements of philanthropy in American history. And if you don't have it, you, you can see it on the, uh, on the Round Table website. Uh, one big change that occurred, uh, we weren't in initially involved in the fight to, to protect philanthropic freedom. But we became involved in 2004 and we became really actively involved uh, in 2005. And this is when, the, we did this because the tax counsel for Chuck Grassley, uh, he was then Republican chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, he issued a bombshell report with over a dozen proposals that would have just devastated charity. And I see from the, the sessions during this meeting, he's still causing a lot of trouble. Since then, no organization has fought more effectively and more consistently to protect the donors and uh, to protect the freedom of donors and foundations than the Philanthropy Roundtable. Now there's a, another reason many donors joined us, and that was be because we became a source of practical solu philanthropic solutions for opening opportunity for Americans of all ethnic and racial backgrounds. Uh, I'll just uh, remember, uh, you know, two of my favorite site visits from our history. One was to go to as a charter school uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, where low-income Hispanic kids were knocking it out of the park. Well, thanks to philanthropy, and thanks in part to the Roundtable and its members, that one school has now scaled to a network of over 130 schools where low-income children excel. Another, si another uh, site visit was uh, we took the Philanthropy Roundtable to prison. And we visited a prison that was training, uh, where there was a great program training inmates to become entrepreneurs. And again, thanks to philanthropy and to many members of the, of the Roundtable, there is now a, a large movement of re-entry programs who are opening up economic opportunity uh, for uh, prisoners when they're released. So I'm going to assume you would agree with what has been stated, but you've obviously been at the helm for a year and a half now. So what are some of the topics, concerns that you are hearing that either are consistent or maybe are just new and different because the world is shifting a bit and most importantly, how's the roundtable position to address them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, this is a group of people who cares deeply about helping people in need. And the reason why we are advocating for our values is because they are best for improving lives and helping people rise. And we all know that. So I think when people come to this table, they're looking to collaborate, work together, be part of a movement to advocate for those values because we know they're best for, for lifting people up and making strong communities and really preserving the importance of the values that this country was built on. And so I, I think that people are coming to find that sense of community, to be part of a movement and to really fight and advocate for what our values are. Um, I think we're well positioned to, to help people with this because you know, because of what Adam and Kim and, and so many of you in this room have been part of for, for such a long time, we have a really strong community already built. And now we have the opportunity to bring in new faces. We have the opportunity to bring in more individual donors who care about these issues, but maybe don't have a place to turn where they can find uh, a resource, people that have been uh, in the grant making world for a long time who can who can help them along uh, and and young entrepreneurs who who really understand uh, the free market and know how they've benefited from it in their own lives but don't realize that philanthropy is another tool for them to express their values 
So I, th I see this as a really incredibly important moment in our country, and the Roundtable as being a really important organization in our movement to bring together all kinds of people who share values and are willing to fight and advocate for them. No, I appreciate that because I have certainly benefited from that as well, sort of riding the coattails um, of the round table. So Adam, let's, let's take a, a sort of a walk down memory lane. You've already referenced sort of the, the first meeting here at the Broadmoor, but are there some particular uh, moments or memories that you have that are particularly rewarding or inspiring or maddening for that matter? I, you know, happy to hear that too. <laughs> uh, I could go on uh, all day about about them, but let me just say that yeah, every about three minutes. So <laughs> every single day of my 19 years with the Roundtable, I was just inspired by our members. Your generosity, your support of your communities, your creativity and your can-do spirit, your differences and passions and priorities that really represent true diversity and getting to know and serving our members. It was so much fun, and it really made me proud to be an American. I'll just, uh, I, there, uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, who was our chairman and, and was, was uh, a great uh, chairman, we were so proud to have her our chairman. She mentioned yesterday the, uh, the critical role of the round table in strengthening the charter school movement and the school choice movement. And that was a, uh, one of my fondest memories. We helped to stop a lot of terrible ideas that would have interfered with your freedom. Uh, I could go on all day, let me just mention one. And that was the proposal of Chairman Grassley's Finance Committee Tax Council to make tax exempt status contingent on accreditation would have taken away, you know, would have just destroyed uh, uh, philanthropic freedom. We played a crucial role as well in, in building the coalition that protected the charitable deduction in the tax reform of 2017. And then as, as we've talked, of, you know, donor intent has been a crucial achievement of the round table. Uh, as Kim Dennis really made this happen, she, she and the round table put donor intent on the agenda of philanthropists. And we've also encouraged donors to strongly consider foundation sunsets as a way to protect their intent. Of course, it's a little unusual for a membership organization to rejoice when many of its most devoted members go out of business. But we've done that <laughs> on many times. Of course, we also have defended the right of foundations to exist in perpetuity as well. You know, just to continue that, uh, I mentioned that when Donors Trust was started, it was the original account holder was a round table member and we wanted to set out a 20 year sort of spend down plan. And last year we actually made the final grant out of that, just showing the consistency that both organizations have had to maintain that. It's a lovely story. So at least let me just sort of put you on a pedestal for a moment. Uh, it's a good thing because something I've always appreciated about you is you have not only an infectious personality, but a spine of steel, um, which I respect greatly. But you know, now that for all of us that are sort of part of this uh, roundtable community, you know, what, what excites you the most now? What can we sort of expect to hear from you um, going forward? Well, the history of the roundtable is really important. The mission, the values, the principles, they are staying the same. And uh, we will continue to advocate for philanthropic freedom, we will continue to work to advance liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. Um, we will continue to look for the most effective solutions. Some of the things that Adam mentioned, and I'll just piggyback on the donor intent. Adam knows this, but uh, he was part of the reason that the Snyder Foundation decided to have a spend down. I, we learned about that concept here at the round table. So that all of those things are gonna be things that we uh, that we continue. Um, I think the, the, the,
the shift that you'll you'll see is is really you know when we went through a strategic planning process and I joined the board in 2019 and Adam was part of this as well with the board um, working through just sort of the next era of the roundtable and I think you can look forward to seeing us be very bold I think you've probably noticed in the in the meeting that we're we are um, taking a bold stance on the on the issues and and being a little being very public about our stances that we lifted our public profile over the last year or so um, intentionally that was a shift that we that we made and it's been uh, an exciting time uh, for for the roundtable for that reason um, and again you know bringing in new faces bringing it in bringing in individuals making sure that we're still serving the foundations and we'll always love the foundations, but bringing in individuals too who really care about this, these issues as well and getting them excited to be part of this movement. So it's the combination of the old and the new and um, bold and, and a higher public profile. And uh, we're, you know, we're just excited to mix that, that history with the next era of the roundtable. Indeed. I think it's fair to say the best years are ahead as much as we celebrate what's happened to get us to this point. So it's an exciting time. Yeah.